Hi, I'm Louis. I'm 13 years old. How did the War of Japan end? It? Hi, I'm Martin Morgan, historian in residence here at the National World War II Museum uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana. How did the war in the Pacific end? Well, the war in the Pacific began at first where the Americans were attempting to cap recapture the real estate that the Japanese had expanded and taken in the early phases of the war. But toward the bitter end, particularly in the year 1945, um, American military forces were arrayed around Japan preparing to invade the Japanese home islands. The first of those invasions was slated to begin in November of 1945 with Operation Olympic, the landings in Kyushu. But before that, the American military was bombing Japanese cities. In fact, beginning in March 1945, the United States military shifted to a nighttime low-level incendiary bombing campaign that absolutely devastated metropolitan areas throughout the home islands of Japan. In fact, 68 cities, as you can see in this graph here, 68 cities were targeted not by atomic bombs, but by conventional bombs and raids that produced destruction that looked like atomic bombing destruction, like this photograph here, neither Hiroshima nor Nagasaki. This is showing the results of the American incendiary bombing raid against the city of Tokyo on March 9th and 10th, 1945, a bombing raid that resulted in more killed than either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. During the months of March, April, May, June, July, and August, American B-29 bombers in, in, in growing formations, formations that were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, were flying over Japanese cities and subjecting them to attacks that produced devastation that looked like this. The Japanese began to refer to the B-29 as B-san or Mr. B. Mr. B would fly over almost every night bombing Japanese cities, weakening the Japanese economy, weakening the Japanese military. But don't be fooled by that because the Japanese military was still extremely strong and capable of fighting off what was the next planned step, the invasion of the Japanese home islands. Before that though, the American military conducted two landings in 1945, one at Iwo Jima beginning in February, a terrible 36 day long battle that was then followed by the 82 day long battle, Operation Iceberg, the invasion and capture of the island of Okinawa. And during the Okinawa battle, the American military learned a very, very important lesson about the, how the Japanese intended to fight. And that lesson was that the Japanese intended to fight to the last man. They intended to use the terrain to their advantage as much as possible. And the American military also saw the ugly side of what war was going to be like around a Japanese civilian population. During the Battle of Okinawa, over 100,000 Okinawans, 100,000 Japanese citizens lost their lives, collateral damage as the result of the battle. And the American military was conscious of that. The American military saw how savagely the Japanese fought for islands like Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. The, Jap the American government realized that even after March, April, May, June, and July of protracted bombing campaign over 68 Japanese cities, in cases where Japanese cities had 48% destruction, and in cases like Toyama, where 95% of the city was destroyed by American air power, we had seen how, despite that, the Japanese still continued fighting. Such is the nature of the Japanese character, that nature of obedience. They would fight to the last man without so much as questioning the supreme authority. And the supreme authority for the Japanese was none other than Emperor Hirohito, the man seen here inspecting the bomb damage after the March raid over Tokyo. And Hirohito was the only person that could count. Hirohito only, was the only person that counted because he was the person that could decide that Japan was no longer going to fight. On August 6, 1945, of course, we dropped a uranium-235 gun device that delivered 15 kilotons of atomic yield over the city of Hiroshima, Japan, followed then on August 9th when we dropped the plutonium device, the Fat Man bomb that delivered a 21 kiloton nuclear yield over the city of Nagasaki. And it was a major escalation of this already devastating air campaign. And that major escalation showed the Japanese something. The Japanese had spent many years of the war where American bombers weren't over their cities. But then beginning in October 1944, they began seeing nightly American bombers coming over. They saw a major escalation in March 1945 when those bombers came in at nighttime flying from low level, dropping incendiary bombs. And then they saw the greatest escalation of all on August 6, 1945, when they saw one plane, one bomb, the total destruction and devastation of a city. And to the only man that counted, Emperor Hirohito, 
after Hiroshima and then Nagasaki, Emperor Hirohito decided that Japan could no longer face this kind of enemy. In fact, Emperor Hirohito, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and of course remember that the day before Nagasaki, the Soviets declared war on Japan and began fighting. And at that stage, Emperor Hirohito finally intervened. Finally, after years and years of war, after months and months of this protracted, incredibly effective strategic bombing campaign that had resulted in the, li in the, the, that had resulted in the loss of lives of millions of Japanese, that had produced millions upon millions upon millions of homeless Japanese, only after the Soviet declaration of war and the atomic bomb over Nagasaki, Emperor Hirohito decided that Japan could no longer suffer as it had, and it was only then that Emperor Hirohito sought to discuss surrender terms with the United States. It's often said that we extracted an unconditional surrender from Japan, and we did not, because there were conditions, and one of those conditions was that Emperor Hirohito would continue as the head of the Japanese state, that the Japanese military would surrender and demilitarize, but that Hirohito would lead post-war Japan into the new world of democracy. Imagine a post-war Germany with Adolf Hitler as the head of state. It's absolutely unimaginable. And yet, we had a post-war Japan where Hirohito, the man that had provide, presided over Jap Japan during what they call the 15 Years' War. For them, World War II began in 1931 and ended in 1945. But Emperor Hirohito, the man that presided over the 15 Years' War, remained the head of state, although a figurehead, in Japan until I was in high school, until, in, until 1989 when he died. This vestige of the Second World War of old Imperial Japan was still there. And World War II ended in, in a way that I still cannot believe. It's still astonishing to think that the United States didn't have to invade the Japanese home island, that the, Jap that the United States didn't continue bombing every single city in Japan, that a greater loss of life didn't happen, that m Americans didn't have to invade Japan and lose their lives, that Japanese didn't have to continue losing their lives in the nightly bombing raids from the B-29s, that the Japanese didn't have to lose their lives as collateral damage to a land campaign after an American invasion. And so on September 2, 1945, an American naval task force sailed into Tokyo Bay and accepted the conditional surrender of the Japanese. And the Japanese then moved into a post-war period where they cooperated with their American allies. The United States occupied Japan until the 1950s when we signed the San Francisco Treaty. And Japan became once again a separate and sovereign nation, but this time not an imperial power in the old feudal imperial system, but a constitutional democracy. And Japan remained one of our closest allies throughout the Cold War and is to this very day a very close friend of the United States, a valuable strategic partner in the East, and an economic partner.